started a little bit as people are coming back from lunch. Um, I'm Tristan Phillips. I'm at the University of Southern California. I work with Jim Cook and Alden. And this is meant to be kind of like a hands-on um, in that I'm going to show a little bit of the gateway and maybe how to use it for your own research. That's kind of the idea. So if you want, I'd encourage you, if you have a laptop, you can pull it out and you can go along with me. You could also just watch what I'm doing up here. Um, and if you have questions along the way, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, I think Jim Cook gave like a nice, like high level view of like, what are the, what are the studies that we work with and what are we trying to do and why it's interesting? And then kind of the idea with my presentation is I wanna show you like how you might actually start to utilize that for your own research. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about that Jim Cook mentioned is harmonized data. Alden also mentioned it um, some. And uh, this is typically the thing that we do that is most helpful for people. Um, who are doing research. Um, so harmonized data sets are created to provide comparable research ready variables. Um, so one really important note is that the harmonized data sets don't include all of, for instance, the survey questions that are in a survey. They really focus on like what's most comparable and most used. Um, uh, there's always linkages that you can link back to. The identifiers, of course, are included. So you can always link back to the individual survey, but because something isn't in a harmonized data set, doesn't mean it's not asked in the survey. And I think that's an important note. Um, we often, you know, I think some people are interested in a really particular measure. Uh, like you mentioned, some of the discrimination questions that were added to the HRS for a while. Um, and so our idea is that like, we have included those, but there's other measures that maybe were asked once or twice and aren't included in this, but there's probably lots of variables that you wanna also consider like um, gender, age, education, marital status, labor force status that you might want to control for, but aren't your like primary variables that you're interested in. Um, and so you could use those from the harmonized data sets um, in combination with those variables that you're most interested in that maybe aren't in these, but actually we do cover a lot. I'll, I'll give you a sense of what we cover. Um, <clears throat> variables are defined as similarly as possible across all harmonized data sets. Um, each data set combines all available waves. So for the HRS that's had like 15 waves of data now, there's uh, one data set that has all of those waves together. Um, and so they're FAT files, each individual is one record. We use a kind of intuitive variable naming convention across all of the harmonized data sets. So a variable like R1 work is whether the respondent is currently working at wave one. Uh, we also make spouse versions of most variables, which is helpful because so most of these interviews uh, interview both the respondent and their spouse, right? And uh, spousal effects are really important. So if you're interested in spousal effects, these um, spouse versions are really important. We also use study specific variable names. So for instance, a variable like R1 LPRF or labor force status underscore E, it's the respondent's labor force status um, in wave one of ELSA, but that underscore E means it's kind of specific to that data set It's underscore E. And that's because labor force is an example of something that's like very different in different contexts. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, we give that underscore E, it's, so it's not gonna be comparable directly, um, but it captures the same concept. Um, variables have been account to, built to account for survey skip pattern, and each data set is accompanied with a harmonized code book. Um, so an example of like a really simple harmonization here is um, on the left side, you have ELSA, the English study. On the right side, you have LC, the Brazilian study, and this is how they asked about smoking. Um, so you can see there's a different pattern that respondents go through when they're asked these questions. And so one of the things that we do um, is uh, we'll just kind of, both of these different patterns of questions can be used to make a, both an ever smoking and a currently smoking variable, but you have to account for them differently. Uh, you also notice that like in the ELSA data, uh, yeses are coded as one, nos are coded as twos. Uh, in LC, actually, they use like this one, two, three system for whether it's daily or not. Um, and so we'll kind of, we standardize both the variable names and the value codes. Um, one of the reasons for us uh, and the reasons that a lot of um, uh, effort has been put into this project is that we realized that so many researchers were using the original data and doing the exact same thing on it. Um, and so the thought is like, oh, if we can do this once and do it right, um, that we could all just uh, use it across different people. And I think this kind of adds again to uh, the thought that if there are more people are using this also, we also find more mistakes. So individuals make more mistakes and 
Um, and any of these data sets, lots of people are using them. We're, we're very transparent about how we created them, and we'll go through kind of that also. Um, but that you're using a measure that's been used by a lot of other people in other studies, I think is helpful. Uh, this is an example that's uh, very simple harmonization. They also get like much more complex. This is how the Japanese study um, asked about uh, household asset savings. Um, and you can see it's like quite complicated. Um, uh, savings is like one of, I think, nine different wealth components that are asked uh, as part of this Japanese study. Um, so there's actually a lot of work that goes into this. Um, you'll also notice that on the bottom right there, uh, there's these three sets of questions, which are called unfolding bracket questions, which are uh, often used for financial values because sometimes it's hard for people to give an exact value. You know, for instance, if I just ask, you know, many of you, uh, you know, what's the total amount you have in your savings account? Um, I don't know how many of us could give like an exact number. If you have more than one saving account, of course, that gets like more complicated. Um, and so what studies do to address this is they use these like unfolding bracket patterns uh, where the interviewer says, okay, is it more or less than 10,000 yen? And if they say more, they can say, okay, is it more or less than or about 100,000 yen, right? And they can say more or less, and then you get a range at which the value lies. And so then we also do imputations, financial value imputations, which Alden talked to you about kind of cognitive value imputations. We also do finan financial value imputations where we try to assign a value in place of that missing value so that if you're uh, doing kind of complete case analysis and your um, regressions or your models, uh, that you're still able to include this person. Um, financial values like cognitive values are things that aren't just uh, missing at random. So there's a lot of bias, um, for instance, Older people are going to be much less likely to recall these financial values. You know, this is these are studies of aging people, so we think about that a lot. People at lower cognitive levels, also people with kind of like um, more complicated or higher levels of wealth or income are also not as able to recall these values. Uh, so any of these will kind of bias your estimations if you just end up dropping those people with missing values out. Um, so we do a lot of work. So, you know, I, I mean, I would say like the programming that our team did with the Japanese team to kind of create like a total wealth measure, you know, it's maybe a month or something of programming. And a lot of people want to use a variable like this, but they don't want to, it doesn't make sense for everyone who's a non-economist to go through and think about all these decisions for each wave of JSTAR that's, you know, been asked of five different waves. Um, so we've done this with study teams and our team together. Um, uh, we develop um, code books, which is really how we communicate what we've done to people mostly. Uh, we also release all of the code that we use to create our harmonized data sets. So you can go from the original survey data to the harmonized data set using the code and see exactly how we coded it. Um, but the data sets are meant to kind of be like very easily readable and to have clear and concise language. So they introduce the harmonization project. They overview survey timing, survey design, sampling framework. They discuss weighting and imputation, detail specifics of the harmonization process. And they divide variables based into a research domain. So you can see here, this is the code book for the English data set, the harmonized ELSA. Um, and you can see our sections here go through demographics, health, insurance, cognition, financial and housing, wealth, income and consumption, family structure, employment, retirement expectations, pension, physical measures. We've also, it's on the next page, but we also have a psychosocial section. Uh, and then we also break down uh, what are the uh, value codes that are used and tabulations? And then we detail kind of on what we try to be as clear as we can in our language, any assumptions that we made in that creation or just how we created it. Um, so we list that um, also. And then I think most helpfully, uh, and this is not something, these kind of information is not easy to find, is we highlight both differences inside of that study at different time points when they ask that question and differences between the studies. Um, so here we kind of mentioned that actually there's like a cross wave skip pattern that happens in ELSA. So once you've asked your sm first smoking question, uh, your the questions that your next follow-up are going to be different. And of course that's because like, maybe they know that you've already smoked in your lifetime and maybe you were smoking last interview, they can ask you questions specific to that instead of asking you again, hey, have you ever smoked in your lifetime? Um, so that's what's happening here. And we try to um, uh, mention that. Uh, and the last thing we do is we list all the variables from the originating data set used in the creation um, of the variable. Uh, and we do spend, like our team spends a lot of time, I think, thinking about transparency, um, partly because we work with study teams um, to design these. And I think these study teams often initially at the outset of our project thought like, you know, why is this helpful if everyone just has the original study data? 
Um, are, are people just going to use your versions, which like feel quite easy to use, but maybe aren't? Uh, you've made some assumptions in it, and they should be doing like all this work individually. And so I think that there is that mindset. Um, so we really think about trying to communicate what we did and why we did it. Um, I mean, I'm certain, having, doing my own research, uh, that having someone else have done some of these, like having worked on uh, psychological measures, for instance, having a team yeah, with a psychological background in those countries having like validated these measures and built them that my work greatly benefits from that. So I'm quite glad for that. But it is important that I also kind of know what they did. Um, so the core harmonized data files uh, that we have are the harmonized HRS. Uh, I'll just say the country instead of the acronym since you've heard a lot of acronyms. So for the United States, Mexico, um, England, uh, SHARE includes Europe, most of the EU countries, as well as Israel, uh, Costa Rica, um, South Korea, uh, Japan, Ireland, um, China, India, and Malaysia. So these are what I say core, kind of what I mean are like the repeated questions that are asked at every interview wave. Uh, we also have other types of data files. Uh, Jen Cook mentioned these end of life surveys that a lot of people do. Because these are longitudinal surveys that are focused on aging, uh, they're also used by a lot of people who uh, think about end of life and mortality. So uh, a lot of these studies have what's called like an, um, an exit or a next of kin interview. So if they come back you know, two years later to the household and someone has passed away who was a respondent before, they say, can we speak to the caretaker or kind of a next of kin of this individual? And we wanna hear about what their end of life was. Like what were their circumstances in the last three months before death? Did they, did they die at home? Did they go to a hospital? Did they you know, move into a palliative care unit? Did they have palliative care come to their house, um, for instance? Um, so these kind of questions are quite important really for understanding like what's, especially the, the context of a person's um, whole life, even kind of uh, retrospectively from this other perspective is really helpful. So we developed these harmonized um, end of life data files that are easily linked to, you can see like how, what, you know, what were the, uh, what was the person's kind of like environment, um, uh, while they were living, uh, what choices were they making, and then uh, also look at um, their death uh, and those kind of end of life outcomes. So we have these for the United States, Mexico, England, Europe and Israel, South Korea, China and uh, Japan. Um, Jim Cook also mentioned uh, these life history data files and I'll, I'll actually talk a little bit more about these because I think these are very interesting. Most of the studies um, that we look at start interviewing people at age kind of like 45 or 50, depending on the context, um, and then follow them through the rest of their life. But there's a whole half or more than half of people's lives that are not captured in these studies. And those are really important, you know? Childhood conditions are really important. People's marriages and childbirths are also really important. Um, so one of the things that's been done to kind of address this, and also if you're a person who's not interested in aging, and you've heard a lot of aging talk uh, so far in the last day and a half, I think these, this might also be helpful for you. Basically what they try to do is in these surveys, they get a sense of, of what was you know, this, these person's uh, life like up until the point of joining the survey. Um, so these includes questions about uh, their, but their parents and their childhood um, and also retrospective questions about their education, their job history, their marriage history, childbirths, accommodation history and health history. And how these are asked, they're asked in a way where uh, it's kind of an interesting way where they, uh, it's different in different countries. And so they'll kind of try to find, I mean, even if you think about your own life, I'm really bad at dates. Um, I usually have to always check what month it is. I, I would do bad on a lot of cognitive um, batteries. I know I never know what month it is. I usually know what day of the week it is. Uh, year, I'm also not great on. My own age, I'm not great on. Uh, and so they have to account for people like me when they ask these. And so they find these kind of uh, different culturally specific timing mechanisms. So like in the United States, 9-11 uh, is like a really important run. Like we can, like I know exactly, you know, where I was, what I was doing at that point. And so they find, and it's just a different, different countries, right? And so they use these kind of like timing mechanisms of something that happened in your own life. Like I also know when I graduated college, right? That's an important time in my own life. So they'll find these kind of like broadly important ones or important to that person and then start to build out from there. Um, so what was your, you know, were you done with school by that point? Were you married by that point? Did you have kids? If so, how many, how old were they at that point? Um, and so then they kind of like build out that way um, using this kind of timing framework. And what we've done is basically, so then what happens is you get a lot of, in the data, you get a lot of like complicated data that has kind of loops. So basically it says like, 
this person's had seven jobs and for each job, here's like the kind of job, here's what they got paid when they ended the job, here's the industry, here's the occupation, um, here's when the job started, here's when the job ended, here's why it ended. And they have this for these seven jobs that they've had at this point, right? And so what we've gone through is we've said at each particular age, we've made these into age sequence files. So at age 35, here's the job that they had. Um, and we've related it that way, which makes these, this data like much easier to use. Um, so you can really build kind of trajectories of a person's life, both before they enter the survey and then start to integrate the survey data to see where they are at that point. Um, so currently we have these for England, uh, for Europe and Israel, for China, uh, we're ch closer to the South Korean survey asked a, a job history file. So only looking at job history. Um, that one is under review. And for the uh, harmonized um, HRS the United States, um, they've asked these questions recently. And so we're in the process of building a comparable data file. Um, as Alden mentioned, and I won't spend too much time on this, we have harmonized HCAP data sets. These are the ones that are currently available and uh, uh, two more that are um, being reviewed or being built. Um, so to obtain the harmonized data, um, mostly the gateway does not distribute data. Um, so most countries uh, want to know who's using their data and why. Um, almost all of these are funded, uh, at least partially, through inside of the country. And so, and rightly so, I think they're protective of uh, there's people, uh, they're, you know, citizens and people who residents data. Um, but the data is released to anyone in the world. Um, that's part of the agreement to kind of be part of this network. Um, so mostly what happens is that like we would develop a harmonized data file and then it gets sent back to that study um, and that study releases it. So that's mostly, uh, there's a few cases where the data are created by the users uh, using data creation code uh, that generates it. So for instance, if for the Korean data who don't distribute the harmonized CLOSA, if you have the CLOSA data, you can just run kind of one long data code uh, and at the end of it, you'll have the harmonized um, CLOSA data. Um, We've also more recently built um, COVID data sets. So a lot of these studies at the start of COVID thought, okay, we have a lot of information about nationally representative populations, particularly of older people, we're in COVID. Uh, one, we, if we had any regular interviews that were going on or were planned, we're gonna cancel them because we can't send people out to people's houses right now. So what are we gonna do instead? And so mostly they quickly developed a bunch of um, smaller, not a whole um, for interview, but uh, developed smaller, what they called COVID samples, and they administered their over the telephone. So they would call and they would say, what's your experience like? And they've done a couple different, they did a couple different rounds of those in the kind of hands-on portion that we're about to switch to. Actually, we're going to use some of this COVID data. Um, uh, so uh, currently, we've built these for um, the United States, for England, and for Europe. Uh, they were also done in a couple other countries that we're building also. Uh, but it's quite interesting. They ask a lot of measures particular to COVID. Um, and so what's nice is that I think, I think what's really interesting is also we're kind of, I'm not sure if we're post COVID, but no one here is wearing a mask yet. Um, so I, I think you can kind of see people both before COVID, during COVID, and then over COVID. I think a lot of the questions in research around COVID are, is there a return to normal or have we, have something about us been altered um, has our trajectory been changed because of COVID and people's individual trajectories? And I think this, this kind of um, offers a really important way to uh, think about that and actually seeing people before, during, and after. And so that data of if we're in a post-COVID uh, era, that post-COVID data is coming out now where people are just being re-interviewed regularly. Um, and uh, we have a kind of a separate site, which is covid.g2aging, and that uh, has links to download um, all of these COVID data sets. Um, we also did a um, uh, COVID interview um, in India as part of the um, LASI sample, or from the LASI sample, I should say. Um, if you do use the gateway, uh, we just ask you to register. Uh, registering uh, will just allow you to download a lot of the documentation that I, uh, we'll talk about today and I have put up here already. It's uh, free and quite easy. Um, and if you do use an endoharmonized data set, um, we also ask that you uh, would include this citation. This helps our funders know that uh, people are using it, which is quite important. Um, uh, and it's also helpful for us. We kind of go through this process where we'll see who's been writing what they, what they have been using, and we'll try to invest more of our own kind of resources on the areas that people are utilizing these from. Um, so let's switch to kind of like the more of the hands-on portion uh, and how I'll do this. 
uh, usually I just kind of propose a research question and then I'll try to walk through the process um, with you all about how you would use the gateway to do this. Um, so the research question here that I'm proposing are, well, what are the characteristics of older workers who stopped working in England just in general? Um, and then are those the same characteristic patterns for those who stopped working uh, during the start of the COVID pandemic? So we know that one thing that happened is that a lot of people lost their jobs at the start of the COVID pandemic. And so um, the question I'm kind of posing here is like, people, especially older people are stopping work for a variety of reasons over time. Do we just see a magnification of those reasons with people who stopped work for COVID or did it especially affect um, certain characteristics of people or types of people uh, who are more likely to stop, right? And so I think we can use uh, these data set to, for this kind of like toy, toy analysis. Um, and really the point of this is just to demonstrate um, how you might use the gateway um, to do this. Um, so this is um, some of the ELSA interviews here. Uh, so in blue, you can see you have their like wave eight, um, which was done like 2016, 2017, wave nine, which is done in 2018, 2019. Uh, and then you can see here in the um, solid line is new COVID cases in England. And then the dotted line here is a COVID stringency index that's developed out of Oxford. And so this kind of is a metric that looks across, it's a, been developed as a way to kind of compare how were stringent were the restrictions on people's uh, schooling, economics, um, uh, interactions with other people during COVID, right? So it's important to think about um, a lot of countries, we certainly know in states in the U.S., if you're from the U.S., a lot of states took really different approaches to uh, when they implemented some kind of restrictions or lockdowns and why and for how long. So this gives us kind of an ability to think about how do these policies affect people. Um, one thing you can see here is that, of course, like although we had like a very small um, in England, they had kind of like a small little jump. Um, I think this is in like maybe March or April of 2020. Um, even before this, like as soon as they had any cases, they started uh, uh, kind of really high stringency. So it really had a lockdown. It affected a lot of people. It affected a lot of jobs. Uh, people couldn't leave their houses. Of course, a lot of um, jobs are just going to shut down, especially service based jobs, for instance. Um, and then um, the ELSA team developed their COVID round one. That's what's in green. And they also did a follow-up um, in yellow. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing for this analysis is I kind of want to compare people um, who were stopping work uh, between wave eight and wave nine, and then people who were stopping work between wave nine and this first COVID round. And this is, uh, interestingly, uh, it's a COVID round. There's not a lot of COVID going on in England, but there's really high restrictions. Um, so I think it makes it interesting to think about uh, what's kind of the impact of these restrictions. Um, you can also see that, you know, if you wanted to think more about times where COVID was like really affecting people's lives, uh, that you might want to use the COVID round two. Um, so to do this, uh, you would download the harmonized ELSA. You're going to identify relevant variables. Uh, we're going to create an indicator variable of uh, stopping work between ELSA wave eight and wave nine. We'll create some additional variables and we'll estimate a multivariate regression of stopping work. So to download the harmonized ELSA, you can do this from the UK data service. I'll also jump over um, to the gateway and just show um, where you would do this. It's on the download site. Uh, and you can see here links to all of the different studies. So where you can get access to find their, um, their original survey data and also their harmonized data. They're generally together, but they're not always. Um, and you can also see we have links. Uh, we have a, what's called like a data access instructions. Um, I will say, Jim Cook mentioned that the tilde data is hard to get access to. And some of the data is harder to get access to. And so these data access instructions can be helpful for saying like, I have a project that I want to work this on. You know, I'm, I need data within, you know, the next month. What are the data sets that are going to allow me to get data, you know, in the next two weeks or something, right? And so this could be helpful um, because some of them do take more time. And some of them are instant, you know, like as soon as you register, you have access. Uh, and then we have links to download the um, harmonized uh, code book. Um, and then we want to think about our variables of interest. So for this kind of like toy example here, these are the things that I thought like, hey, in this toy model, this is what we should include. Um, so uh, we'll keep our unique identifier. I want indicators of people who participated at wave eight and wave nine. I've also listed out like what that variable name is in the harmonized data set itself. Um, we're gonna use uh, cross-sectional analysis uh, weights in this case. You could also use a longitudinal weight if the study provided it, or we could create our own. 
for this example, I'm just going to use the cross-sectional weight. Um, and then I thought gender could be an important component. We uh, know that a lot of women had to stop work um, during the pandemic, particularly if they had more childcare duties at home. Um, age and interview, I think, is important. Uh, whether someone was working each wave, uh, the self-report of their health at each wave, and couple-level wealth at each wave, and marital status. So there's a couple of ways you can find like what's available. So all of these I've kind of told you just because I know, and I spent time building these slides, that these are available as part of ELSA. If you didn't know that, I think you can kind of use the gateway to find whether what you're looking at is available. Um, so if you look at surveys at a glance here, you can also search by subtopic. And so for instance, you could go down to the topic um, here, you know, we're interested, let's say self-report of health. Um, so we could look at self-reported health status, and we're going to say we're interested in the harmonized ELSA, and we're interested in the years 2016, 2018. Um, and so you can search for that, and what you're going to get is this variable name and how it's coded. Uh, and so you can find it, whether it's comparable or not. Um, so this is a good way to just find like what's available. The other tool on the gateway that's helpful for this um, is the concordance tables. Um, so for a number of different topics, we've built these concordance tables. So if we go down here, we could look at the one for employment, since this is kind of broadly an employment-focused example. Uh, so you can see how studies asked about currently working for pay, which is the variable I end up including here. Um, and we kind of highlight differences between studies, which are really important. If you're going to use two studies together, it's really important that you know how comparable these are. Um, so in the HRS United States data, this is like asked at the present time. Um, in the ELSA data, which is what we're using here, they ask um, of any work, it's regardless of whether you're paid or not. So for instance, if you worked for your family business, and for instance, maybe you don't take home um, pay, you would still be included here. Uh, and this is in the last month. So that time frame is probably important. And you can see how this differs a little bit. Um, uh, you could also see if we kind of scroll down further, you know, if we look at, if we wanted to look at hours of work, uh, you know, if you want to include people's second job, you can see that not all studies ask about hours of work at the second job. So if you kind of have a research topic in mind and you're thinking like, is there anything on the gateway that's helpful? I think these are a good place to start of thinking like, if I'm interested in something cross country, what are the countries or the studies that are comparable? Um, and what might they be? I think the other place to, that's uh, nice to look is the harmonized um, code books themselves. So this is the harmonized um, ELSA code book, which I showed earlier. Um, and for instance, we could go down to the employment section and again, look at currently working for pay. Uh, and we can see these variables and we could also see text about how it was created, whether there was any cross wave differences and differences uh, with the RAND HRS. So we kind of use the HRS as our basis for comparison. Uh, and so we mentioned here that difference uh, in these questions between the HRS and ELSA. Um, um, Okay, so we've identified our variables. I'm going to, I'm just gonna, for the purposes of time, I'll just show this is data code here. Uh, the, the data sets are released in, for most studies are released in Stata, SAS, SPS, and uh, sometimes R, but you can easily read a Stata file into R2 if that's what you end up using. So we're gonna identify these relevant variables. Uh, we're gonna create an indicator of stopping work um, between ELSA waves eight and wave nine. Uh, so for this, really, I, we're only going to look at all, uh, people who are working at wave eight, and then we want to know at wave nine, uh, are they still working or they're not working? So that's how we're going to build this indicator. A one here is going to be people who stopped working between these waves. We're going to create um, a couple additional variables. So we're going to create an age category. We'll look at age categories here. Uh, ELSA starts interviewing people at age 50, although it does include their younger spouses, but uh, for representativeness, we're just going to talk about people 50 to 54, 55, 59, and so on. Uh, we'll, uh, we had this health indicator, which we saw before, uh, which has five levels. But what I'm going to do for this uh, toy example is just say just poor health. So everything else is fine health. But if you said your health was poor, I'm going to put you in one category called poor health. Uh, I'm going to use uh, per capita household wealth. I think wealth might be wealth is often important when we think about whether people stop working, right? People might be more likely to stop working if they have more money at home. Um, and so we can use this uh, wealth variable here. We have some households that have one person and some that have two. Wealth is generally thought about as a kind of couple or benefit level um, unit um, and not an individual level unit. So if there's two people, I'm just going to divide it by two. 
Um, and then I'm gonna make tertiles out of that. So we'll just have low, um, middle, and high. My tertiles, I only do for people of, of the sample of people who are working. So we're gonna exclude everyone else from making those, um, those three categories of wealth. Um, and then the next step is we're just gonna estimate a multivariate regression of stopping work. Um, so we're gonna use a, log a lo 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 logistic regression here. We're gonna set our weights with SB weight. You can also, I should say, you can get more specific also in specifying, uh, specifying the stratification and clustering based on the study. So, and that can be important. It's gonna affect particularly your standard errors. Um, but we're just gonna use our cross-sectional wave eight weight here and uh, use this kind of stata code. And we're gonna include these covariates. Um, uh, and so what you can see in this, I've just plotted out the odds ratio because this is like a much nicer way to look at it. Uh, so you can see just kind of like between eight and nine, which is kind of pre-COVID, um, you can see the effects that we see that are kind of significant and strong. We see an age effect kind of happening over age 65. It's kind of continues on um, uh, throughout uh, 75 and over. Uh, we can also see this self-reported health actually um, is significant. So people who do have self-reported poor health are more likely to stop working, right? So, and these are the effects that are coming out in this very simple example here. Um, what we can do now in part two is just, we can bring in that extra round of uh, COVID data. Um, and this is quite simple. So we can, um, the ELSA COVID data is actually not released yet. So, but um, you, the harmonized also COVID data is not, but you can use, you can create it uh, using the state of creation code that we've provided on the gateway website. Um, so you can create it. Basically, all it requires of you is you just change your folder locations for where you've stored the data and you run it um, and then you'll have access to that data. Um, we really only need two variables from this COVID data set for this analysis. Um, which is whether someone was in round one of the COVID data and whether they were working. So the same question about working was asked um, as part of the COVID data, uh, COVID survey. Uh, we're gonna merge that in using the same unique identifier. Uh, we're gonna create our indicator of stopping work between ELSA wave nine and COVID round one. Uh, we'll make basically the same set of additional variables, but here our baseline is gonna be wave nine instead of wave eight, because we're looking between wave nine and our COVID round one. Um, and then we're gonna estimate this same multivariate regression of stopping work. Um, we're gonna use the not wave nine weight, but everything else kind of looks exactly the same. Um, and so we can see some uh, interestingly different patterns. Um, so one thing is that we see an age effect starting from earlier ages, which we didn't see before. So, and the age effect is more graduated. Um, the age effect before was mostly related to like pension claiming age um, in England, but we can see this kind of graduated age effect where people are stopping work, uh, more likely to stopping work by a lot of people at older ages, um, even amongst the older ages um, themselves. Uh, you can also see that uh, we don't see an effect of poor health anymore that's statistically uh, significant, which I think is interesting to think about why might that effect have been present regularly and in a way that we don't see now. You know, I think one thing I didn't include in these regressions are uh, whether someone was in England, what they called a key worker, what we called an essential worker here. Um, and these are people who maybe could have um, kind of harder jobs or might be uh, more likely to be in kind of um, uh, poor health uh, from their jobs themselves, but were kind of forced to continue to work throughout the pandemic. And so they kept jobs. So I think that could be, you know, if I, my next step, if I was gonna continue in this analysis, be thinking about what are the characteristics more of kind of these jobs that could kind of explain some of these differences. Um, uh, so this is just like a really simple example um, of how you might think about using it. Uh, and really my purpose is just kind of to illustrate that there's a lot of work that's already been done on these variables. And so you can really focus on uh, your research question in a way that I think hopefully we're all able to do kind of uh, more research um, and thinking about like your particular questions of interest instead of spending more time um, uh, you know, creating a lot of variables that are uh, you maybe outside of your particular expertise. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, and here's uh, more about the gateway. The other thing I'll mention is if you're interested um, in using the gateway at all, we have like a email and we get back to basically everyone who emails us within 24 hours. Um, and we do uh, webinars and blogs. Yeah, we have a lot of people who email us now instead of the study teams because they'll take weeks to get back and 
uh, Jen Cook stays on us pretty well about uh, answering emails quickly. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'll take any questions now if anyone has any.